something so conflicting that we actually had two Hamilton City Councillors go on provincial television to argue about it in front of the entire province. It's an issue so contentious that this past week we also saw a cabinet minister write a letter to the Hamilton Spectator calling Hamilton's position on the issue irresponsible and accusing them of having their head in the sand. And it is an issue so critical to our climate that here on the OSHO we have the former federal minister of the environment and climate change and infrastructure, Catherine McKenna, joining the program. Welcome to the O Show for your first appearance, and I hope many more because there's so many things I'd love to talk to you about, Catherine McKenna. You are Hamilton born, and of course, uh, you are passionate about climate change, which is what we're talking about here today on the program. But this is the O Show, so I gotta ask you because Hamilton wants to know are you going to run for mayor? <laughs> what? Oh my gosh. I think I wore a shirt once, and when I was going to Hamilton, and it said, like, Hamilton is home. And then everyone's like, oh my gosh, she's moving home. People in Ottawa thought I was moving home. Um, I love Hamilton with the bottom, from the bottom of my heart, as everyone probably knows. My parents live in the same house they've lived in and I go back as much as I can. But I'm gonna just call any rumors. I am not running for mayor. And by the way, you have awesome people who I you know, think would be great. I don't know, Keenan Loomis, like why not? He, he would be great. Certainly someone who uh, has been a great advocate for the city, for businesses, for LRT. So anyway, but Hamiltonians will decide, but I will not be on the ballot. Maybe my dad, I'll ask my dad, maybe John <laughs> Now don't float another McKenna name in the mix here, Catherine. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that because actually on last week's O show, we had a little bit of an exclusive that Keen and Loomis is seriously looking at it. David Christopher oh. also considering it. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, considering getting back in public life anyway, we'll see what happens with David, but Thank you for making that clear on the record. <laughs> Catherine McKenna is not going to come into the mayor's race this year. No. All right. Climate change, climate change, climate yes, change. Exactly. That's what I'm focused on. And let me start with LRT though quickly. Thank you on behalf of many Hamiltonians for helping to get uh, you know, the, the puck in the net as it were and bringing that funding into Hamilton. And I wanted to ask you, one of the things that you distinguished with your LRT discussion was the need for affordable housing. And as we talk about climate change, I see the issues as being really intermingled because we need to have urban intensification. That's part of the reason why uh, people are so concerned with opening up the urban boundary. Uh, but also the LRT route is meant to be a place for affordable housing and that kind of densification. So how do you see, I guess, the state of LRT affordable housing within the broader picture of climate change and what the city needs to be doing? Well, uh, so, I mean, I think all these issues are linked, right? Like at LRT, we certainly, um, you know, we worked really hard with, with uh, to get the province there. Let's be clear, they weren't, you know, we may remember what happened um, when the minister had to leave town uh, when they canceled it. But anyway, it worked really hard to bring them to the table and, and certainly Leuna was great, but, you know, you have to include other things. And we certainly, you know, making sure there's affordable housing built into this is critically important. Um, and, you know, look, climate change is real. Um, it's happening. That's what I'm entirely focused on. How do we scale climate solutions globally? And when you think about intensification, that's related to it. Um, and, and it's obviously we need more affordable housing uh, across Canada and certainly in Hamilton. And that was built into LRT. It was one of the conditions um, that we agreed to with the with the province. But you know, the, the worry we have, and it's funny because my parents have a, have a, the sign in their property, stop the sprawl. I was like, I applaud this. I, what exactly is it? So we had a good discussion about it. Um, look, I think Hamiltonians, of course, want more affordable housing. Um, we all want more affordable housing, but that, it, you know, how do you do that? And I, I actually read a letter, I think, in The Spectator. I get people send me things. So the Hamilton Spectator, someone made the point, oh, really, like these developments that you're talking about, they're not actually affordable. Like, who are they affordable for? So I think that we just need to be smarter about how we do things. Um, and we need to make it so people want to live in the downtown core. Um, I was lucky. I grew up in kind of the Kirkendall neighborhood. It was great. We were able to walk a lot of places, take the bus. Uh, and that's why transit is really important. And, and also building more affordable housing in the downtown core where you can access these services and of course, the reality is your, your carbon footprint is a lot less um, when you're able to do that. And there's certainly a movement. Like, I think young people, I talk to them, 
Many of them have no interest ever having a car. They want to be able to walk places. So it's also about how do you have a livable city? Um, and uh, I worry that, you know, we have provinces, you know, the province of Ontario kind of like telling Hamilton, I'm sorry, you Hamiltonians may want uh, to not have this sprawl, but we're actually going to push forward on it. Um, you know, they say they're committed to climate change. So this is all related. Uh, and we're all making big investments. Well, I'm no longer part of government, but the federal government with the province um, is making a very significant investment in Hamilton um, on LRT. So let's take advantage of that. And, and it's great because I actually saw a map somewhere and it was looking at all the new developments and a lot of it along the line was affordable housing. So that's, look, I think it's a good news story, but for a number of reasons, for climate change reasons, um, but also because Hamiltons don't want the sprawl. And uh, also, you know, I don't think the province always gets to just say too bad. Uh, we're going to be working with developers and you got to accept it. I think that, um, you know, we need to just be reasonable and, you um, Certainly, uh, I, I love Hamilton, and I, I think that we have, a, you know, it's a really great city. And building up the downtown core, getting more people living there, building more affordable housing, building better public transit, um, good for the planet, but also good for the city. One of the arguments that the provincial minister made when he penned his uh, article or his column to the spec was to say that, you know, there is going to be a very, a lot of demographic shift. The GTA is one of the fastest growing areas. We're going to see a huge amount of population coming in. We're going to need affordable housing. And if we don't expand the urban boundary, how are we going to make that happen? So he was kind of making the argument that there's a housing shortage, there's a population change coming, and we have to responsibly look forward, a longer planning horizon even, to be able to accommodate that. And he sees the only way of doing that is having the boundary expanded. And in fact, called the city irresponsible because the city put out a survey from the planning department asking citizens, and 18,000 Hamiltonians responded to it, Catherine, which blows me away, because that's huge yeah. civic engagement. And of those 18 thousand 90% did not want the expansion of the urban boundary. So now we've got the province coming in and going, well, you know what, don't like that, want you to expand it. So what would be, I guess, from your vantage point, the, the counter argument to that? Why do we need to have these large or unaffordable houses built on precious soil and farmland when we have so many empty lots in the city as it is and such a need for densification, as you mentioned, along the LRT? Well, look, I mean, I'm not a city planner, and I think you're fortunate to have some really smart folks um, engaged and who really care uh, about the city, but who think really hard, like, what is the best, you know, laid out city? What are the lessons we can learn internationally? And so, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to folks um, in Canada, cities, municipalities, but also internationally. And the best, you know, sure, some people want to live, you know, further away, that's fine. Um, but you do want more intensification and look at the downtown core of Hamilton. I mean, I think that you've seen it gentrify, but there's still like, I mean, there's still a lot of opportunities there and a lot of opportunities for folks to be close to their work, for, for kids to be close to school where they don't um, put such a stress on the environment um, or, you know, on, on new facilities that are needed uh, to serve them in you know a broader area and look i'm not going to say that doesn't mean you never develop anywhere i'm not the city planner i know that folks think about that but i i think that the the future of the modern city is is intensification it's making it easier to get around it's maybe not having massive houses um but certainly i mean my focus has always been in politics about those that that you know need support um, you know, not rich people. <laughs> it's about like, you know, people, where can government really play a role and how can these services help people? And you can access services much more easily in the downtown core. Um, it's certainly incumbent on cities to work with levels of government to build affordable housing in the downtown core. But think about like, let's just think about this, like from a, a perspective, I'm not even really doing it from a climate perspective, but if you're someone who is really low income, um, living out, you know, far outside the city without access to services that you might need, um, you know, where maybe beyond uh, public transit. I mean, how does that how does that help you? I think that, you know, to do that, you, you need to be actually often quite well off. But that's I mean, that's a broader discussion. I just think from a pr the perspective of climate, we just have to be smarter about cities. Um, we have to be more efficient about the use of resources. There is space um, and buildings uh, and um, opportunities in the downtown core and that creates a more vibrant city. 
it's more fun. And actually, to be honest, a lot of the people that decide to move from Toronto, they want to be able to live in a downtown core. They don't want to live in suburbs. They choose Hamilton because it's a city. And I always have to tell my Torontonian friends, it's not GTHA, guys. It's actually Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton is not a suburb of Toronto. Hamilton is actually a vibrant city that's actually often a lot cooler <laughs> than, uh, you know, what you have in Toronto. So um, I think that that's, that's certainly something I want to help. But look, it's not up to people like me. Like, you know, you can have me on the show. I'll tell you all sorts of things. But I think the fact is, you know, you hear loud and clear from Hamiltonians. And that's something levels of government need to also listen to citizens. That is something I definitely learned in politics. Well, let me ask you one final question then, Catherine, just about climate change and the city that you love. Clearly, you love Hamilton. I'm new to Hamilton 25 years ago, but I love the old bones. It reminded me a bit of Montreal, right? It's just not a suburb. It is has its own identity and has so much going for it. But we had a guest on last week on the program, Mark Cripps, who works in climate change all day long. And he said that what is coming with climate change is going to make the pandemic look like a cakewalk. Those were his words. Is Hamilton, in your estimation, from what you're aware of, or you can speak more broadly if you need to, doing enough to prepare for climate change, its impacts on cities, and even mitigation strategies? Do you think we understand what's coming to us? No, but I mean, that doesn't put, like, that doesn't put Hamilton in minority, it's everyone. Uh, I think that you can look um, at projections and actually there's a good climate atlas that's been done for Canada and you can look at what the projections are under different scenarios. And of course, that's why we all need to dig deep. Global leaders need to come together at Paris, uh, sorry, in under the Paris Agreement in Glasgow and actually have more ambition because different scenarios are going to have different impacts. But every city is already paying, you know, they're already paying the price. And there's a whole range of ways that climate imp impacts um, on cities. So extreme heat, mm -hmm. extreme heat. Many people don't have air conditioning. So, and in seniors, we saw in BC and in, in, you know, that the seniors were dying because it was just so hot. Flooding, you know, you see flooding. That is one of the biggest issues right now um, in terms of costs of climate change. The Insurance Bureau of Canada is, has, you know, estimates and it's, it's massive but it's, it's heating lakes. So think about Lake Ontario, it heats up. The impact uh, of that on the ecosystem, um, you know, there's so many extreme storms. So when you have huge rainfalls, well, then you have sewage runoff that you can't handle. Your infrastructure literally can't handle it. Um, your grid, uh, you know, if it's really, really hot, um, then, you know, the demands on the grid are too much and you have blackouts. So, I mean, I don't want to be doom and gloom, but the reality is, we all need to be a lot smarter uh, about climate change and we're all gonna need to make the investments because we're paying one way or another. We're either paying uh, you know, now and we're gonna pay a lot less and be smarter about being more resilient um, or we're gonna pay a humongous price later and we don't even understand um, the impacts of climate change fully because there's interactive effects of that. So, um, but I'm, a, I'm an optimistic realist or a realistic optimist, depends on the day. So I mean, we can do things, we can be smarter, we can reduce emissions. It's great to see the city, you know, is really thinking hard about public transit, but, you know, energy efficient, affordable housing. We need to do retrofits, we need to do all those things, but we need to build resilience. So we need to think about what are different scenarios and how do we protect the population? Because ultimately that is the responsibility of the city. So whether it's seniors, um, whether it's people's homes, stopping it from flooding and not building in floodplains, um, whether it is making sure your grid is resilient. Um, there's a whole range of things that we all need to be doing. Um, and, and that requires levels of government working together because that'll require a significant quantum of investment. We have uh, invested, the, well, the federal government um, you know, has invested in adaptation, but it's gonna require a lot more money and we're gonna have to work with everyone, the private sector, um, the public sector, and really figure this out because it's going to, we know we can't stop climate change right now. Um, and we know that we are, the planet is warming and we're seeing the impacts. Having said that, we also need to reduce our emissions so we can minimize it and, and actually make sure that we're in a place where, you know, they, they're gonna be impacts, but they aren't the extreme impacts that would be extremely concerning. 
Well, Catherine, thank you for all of that and the great advice on it. And even though you're not getting back into politics, at least not as the mayor of Hamilton, as you've told us, I do continue to look forward to your leadership on climate change. And uh, thank you very much for being on Hamilton's Current Affairs show on The O Show. It is really where we try to bring in voices that people trust on the issues they care about. And we should care about climate change. That's what I'm here. We should care about climate change. And I should, I care about the hammer. So hide everyone in the hammer. Love the hammer. You will see me back. See me on Mock Street, wandering around. Awesome. Well, we Take hope care. to have you back on the O Show. Have a great day. Take care. Okay, bye. Joining me now on the O Show to talk about climate change and some of the insights that we just heard from Catherine McKenna, the former federal cabinet minister for environment and climate change and infrastructure. We have Linda Lukasik here from Environment Hamilton. Linda, you are the executive director of Environment Hamilton. And wow, you have been busy the last week between Stop the Sprawl and what happened at a park that we're gonna talk about in just a moment, but welcome to the O Show. Thank you, great to be here, Laura. And I also want to welcome our other panelists. Uh, uh, you all know Don McLean. He's with Catch Citizens City Hall. How long has Catch been doing its thing? Thanks for having me. And it's been since 2004. Wow. That's so, amazing. Uh, what's that, 16 years, uh, 17 years? Uh, your name certainly uh, is something associated with transparency. And that's what we want to talk about. But first, let me go to you, Linda, because you had some comments that I read and you used the word shocking. And I know you not to be somebody who speaks hyperbolically, so it must really be bad if you're using that kind of language. We are talking, Hamilton, about a park, a central park that we knew uh, had problems with the soil. It was a previous industrial place and we all knew that. It was so bad that there was like ooze seeping out of the ground, right? Disgusting stuff. So since we knew about this for a while, Linda, going back probably, I don't know, a decade at least, why is it now that you're shocked? What happened this week that, that has you asking for more transparency at City Hall? Yeah, well, I, I found out about some documents that were uploaded to a bidding website, um, and it was Joy Coleman who alerted me to, to these docs, so sort of read them through the watermarks, and I, I was shocked to see um, some of what's happened at that site historically, um, and I guess more, you know, if anything, wanting to see the city share more information up front with the community about what they've found through their consultants investigations of the site, because these are reports that have this is work that's been done over the past few years, and it's information that I believe people really need to be aware of. There's some pretty substantial remediation work that's, some of it's been done already, some is still happening for that site, and the community has a right to understand that. Linda, when I was listening to or reading some of the comments from residents who have lived around there and have experienced what seems like very high rates of cancer. It reminded me a little bit of the movie Aaron Brockovich way back in the day. Um, these citizens have known that the land is contaminated. Has there been enough engagement, information, support from the city, do you think, on this issue? And would you have even found out about it if there wasn't a bidding process and Joey hadn't alerted you at Environment Hamilton about what he saw? Yeah, I, I keep comparing it to the old Rennie Street landfill and Dawn and I were both very involved in, in that effort. And I can tell you, mind you, we, we charged the former city of Hamilton. We, we pursued charges under the Federal Fisheries Act and that was a very involved process. We had a community liaison committee. We lobbied and were provided with support to have our own arms legs expert to help us to understand what the city was proposing in terms of remediation. Very engaged process. And I contrast that to this site, which really, you know, seems in many ways like an old landfill, just with some of the historic uses and some of the challenges and some of the remediation that needs to happen. And, and my sense is that, well, I had a hard time finding information on the city's website. Uh, all I could find was information about the wonderful work that's going to be done to upgrade the park. And that's good. And the end use is a positive thing, but people need to understand what's, what, what the, the legacy challenges that are there, what's being done, what some of the risks are to them. And it really feels as though uh, we're lacking in that public information right now. So one of the things that I said, it's not too late, get that information out there and listen to community. Again, we learned that with Rennie where probably the most important information that we found out and that was shared with the city was information from longtime residents. People know instinctively, they see it, they smell it, they know when something's not right. And, and the lesson there is you listen, you pay attention to what community is saying. 
Don, I can't imagine how frustrating this is for you, given all the work that you've done all these years. When I think of how the indigenous water walkers tried to warn the city about sewer gate, because they knew there was something wrong in the water, to Linda's point, people smelt it, they saw it, they tried to get the city to listen, and there was no transparency there, as we know. Uh, the Red Hill, we saw the cover up of that, you know, the city lied, people died, and there's a judicial public inquiry that's supposed to happen soon on that front. Is this another example of a lack of transparency at council? Do they not want residents to know what they know? I mean, I, I just don't understand why they just wouldn't get everybody to help on something this significant. It may be an example of that. It's hard to tell. Uh, I'm not familiar with this one, uh, but in general, uh, I think uh, there is a, a bit of a bunker mentality at City Hall. Uh, that they're concerned that uh, they're going to end up in the media in a light that is not uh, beneficial to the re-election process. Um, and I think there's also just been uh, structurally uh, uh, an expectation that the only people who really care about these are city councillors and staff, and we really don't need to tell anybody else about it uh, because this is not uh, something of concern. Uh, so I think those kinds of things affect what comes out of City Hall and what doesn't come out of City Hall. Um, and there may well be just a, uh, 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 an internal crisis going on uh, because there's a lot of things happening right now. And uh, uh, Sewergate, as you mentioned, uh, was uh, not a pleasant experience for City Council. Um, and I'm sure, you know, if you go and talk to them, they would be saying, oh, we weren't treated fairly on this. This wasn't explained properly. The, the public doesn't understand this and so on. It's standard stuff for anybody who's dealt with media that the media never seems to get right what you want them to get right. <laughs> well, I can speak to that having been in the media for a while. <laughs> uh, but having said that, though, you talked about how council didn't love Sewergate. Uh, they haven't been held accountable for it yet. I mean, of course, the MOE is, is working with them on what it's going to cost to remediate and all the rest of it. But they knew about it before the last election. We revealed a, a tape showing them taking that vote before the last election on the first O show this season, thanks to the great work and digging of Cameron Kretsch and of I elect Alex Zafer and, and Greg Crawford putting up the video together. And then they got elected because nobody knew about it. Presumably, you know, that might have been a factor. And then they decided again not to tell us the depth and breadth of the 24 billion spill, liter spill of mixed sewage into Coots Paradise, our world biosphere. Uh, so I don't think that surrogate is over for them. I expect it, I hope, that every single Hamiltonian, when they come knocking at the door, says, What did you do about surrogate? Why didn't you tell us? And for new people, what would you do had you been in that room, in that in camera meeting? So on, on that issue of how the city handles environmental stuff, I want to start with you, Don, on on, sewer, on um, Stop the Sprawl. Why does it matter so much? Why are so many people, 18,000 residents, as I told Catherine McKenna, actually completed a city survey, which is massive in my mind. Why is stopping the sprawl and keeping the urban boundary where it is important from your point of view, if it is? Well, the reason I think that they, we've gotten to this point in terms of the numbers of people who are involved is this is a very long standing issue. We have watched for decades uh, the city continuously turn to destruction of farmland, destruction of rural areas in order to accommodate more sprawl, more uh, very wealthy, very expensive houses. Uh, and that uh, rubs uh, people the wrong way. And they gradually, I think, come to the understanding, and it's become quite widespread now, that that's a very expensive process. And that the reason we can't afford to maintain our existing infrastructure is very much tied up with what happens to that development, whether that development is permitted or not. Uh, because we've continued, what we've effectively done is we've continuously expanded the size of the city without significantly adding population. So we've got far more city to take care of, but a similar number of taxpayers. So the old city, for example, we looked at numbers back to, uh, uh, the uh, census uh, from uh, the last 50 years. And in the last 50 years, if you look at the area north of Mohawk Road, so Mohawk Road to the harbor, that old city section has lost over 60,000 residents. The population has fallen by 60,000. And of course, it's growing south of Mohawk. 
as all of that area got built out into more suburban areas. That looks nice, but if you look at it in terms of who's paying the bills and how we're able to afford paying the bills, we can't do it anymore. We can't actually pay for the, the fixing of our existing infrastructure, of our roads and pipes and fire stations and whatever. Um, and at this point, we're close to $4 billion behind. That shortfall is almost $4 billion. Uh, and council, uh, to this point, I don't think has even acknowledged that that's what is driving this problem. They hear this report every year from the city finance manager saying, you know, we're going another $200 million behind in, in maintenance because we don't have the money to do it. One of the councillors asked two, three years ago, what would it mean, what would it take to stop going in that hole? And the answer was a 30% tax increase. And that wouldn't get rid of the shortfall. That would just stop us from enlarging it. So we've got a significant financial problem and sprawl development on new areas that we have to provide new roads and new pipes and new services for is a major cause of that. It's probably the fundamental cause. And we've been told about this for years. Uh, the Golden Commission in Toronto in the 90s said, you know, sprawl is hellishly expensive aside from a whole lot of other problems with it, but it really kills you financially as a municipality. Uh, and our planners don't seem to be willing to talk about that or take that into account. So Don, just before I get back to Linda, because I, I really want to um, talk about the, our, the letter that was written to the Hamilton Spectator by the provincial minister around sprawl and our approach to it here in Hamilton. But Don, when you said they don't get it, they don't seem to understand the causal effect of sprawl with that $4 billion deficit that you just talked about. Is it that they don't get it or that there are other interests at play at City Hall that really, really want to build outside the urban boundary and really, really want to make money on those precious farmlands uh, with houses? I mean, you watch City Hall, you're down there. What do you think it is? Is it a blind, are they blind to it? Are they willingly blind? What's going on? Uh, I think if you look at municipal politics, um, and we looked at the donations to campaign, campaign donations to councillors, uh, and one of the amazing things about this that struck me immediately was there were no donations from Stelco, DeFasco, uh, any of the big companies. When we started looking at this, I started looking at it in 95. Uh, they were all developers that were making these uh, large financial donations and basically funding the election campaigns of the councillors that were there. Uh, so I think there's been a, a long-standing culture here that what developers want, developers get, and they put their money in to make sure that they get the right decisions from council on their behalf. Uh, they are there uh, in the planning department, probably on a daily basis, uh, working out the details of these things. Uh, and the thinking has been, well, this is just normal. Uh, the normal process is we just keep expanding because we get more houses that way and we get more taxpayers that way. And uh, allegedly that's going to give us more finances. And in fact, it gives us less. Many of the people who moved into the area south of Mohawk moved there from the old part of the city. They weren't new with taxpayers. They were just occupying areas that required new infrastructure and more city funds to manage it. So Linda, so I think there's been a long-standing culture there, uh, and uh, it's really being challenged right now. The number of people who responded to the survey and the number who said no boundary expansion uh, is revolutionary, really, in Hamilton. And it's got everybody who's on the developer's side uh, in in a bit of an, a bit of their knickers in a knot, as such. Uh, and and that includes Steve Clark, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, who has jumped in with both feet. Well, and let me pick up on that, Linda, because talk about knickers mm -hmm. in a knot. Uh, there's actually a PR campaign that went out from the development side of things that got highly criticized by a lot of Hamiltonians. To Don's point, it's revolutionary, 18,000 people, 90% of which uh, saying don't expand the urban boundary. And so you've and now and you've also got to Don's point development money in municipal politics we all know that and it hasn't maybe challenged been challenged before don but it's certainly being challenged now i'm challenging it now other groups like i elect are watching very closely you know who is funding these municipal campaigns as we head into another election but linda so we've got we've got though that culture that don talked about developers city councillors election campaigns and now we've got 
a minister weighing in. Those are two strong headwinds against this effort to stop the sprawl. What can we realistically do about it? Keep on fighting. I mean, that's what we have to do. I think the the response from the public has obviously got, I mean, that astro chirping campaign from the development industry has been quite incredible. And it's it's fueled by, you can't help but look at it and think what a sense of arrogance and a sense of entitlement just in terms of their, assu their assumption that they have a right to continue in the way that they have. And what you're seeing here with a lot of Hamiltonians who are pushing back, and I'll add, it's not just Hamiltonians, these battles are being waged right across the greater Golden Horseshoe. People are saying, wait a minute, what about the public good? What about heading in a better direction for, our, for, for us and, and for our kids and for our grandkids, for the future of our communities? We know with the climate crisis, there are more people talking about the importance of protecting farmland. And people are also having more and more frank conversations about um, inclusivity in our city. Do we think that growth on the edges, on these greenfield lands is going to help us with the housing crisis in this community? Let's be honest, it's not going to help us. It's not gonna provide us with that urgently needed affordable housing. When you look at the planning literature, when you look at, um, you know, what's out there in terms of information and understanding, it's that infill development, it's that missing middle that really opens the door to that spectrum of housing that provides you with the affordability that we urgently need um, in our, in our communities. So people are waking up to that. I mean, we are having, I think Don and I would both say to you, we would never imagine, you know, a few years ago that we are having these deep conversations with Hamiltonians about planning and about the climate crisis and about building sustainable communities. Um, and while we're having this conversation at the same time, all of these other wonderful pieces are unfolding. You know, Catherine McKenna and the push to, to get that funding for our LRT, we know that's moving ahead. And there's so much potential there to pursue the kind of future and build the kind of future that we know we need for our city. So while on the one hand, we've got that noise from the developers who are used to having it their way, we've got this wonderful still growing movement and it is a truly grassroots movement. There ain't no astroturf happening there. I'll tell you when it comes to stop sprawl ham on. These are real people who are who are really interested in these issues, and and they're growing and building strong networks across movements in the community. Um, I think it's a really exciting time, despite yeah. that. So I'm going to say we're we're all going to continue to push, and I'm optimistic that we're going to see a positive outcome for Hamilton well, as, in this effort. I as Catherine McKenna said, she's a realistic optimist or an optimistic realist, depending on the day. But her parents have a stop the sprawl sign on their front lawn. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, and so when you say fight, I just want to dig down on this as our final question here for both of you, because, you know, you have made a case of why this sprawl is not good for the city and what motivates it. Uh, Catherine McKenna talked about the fact that this is a, not a unique to Hamilton situation. You know, um, the climate change is something that's impacting all kinds of cities. And that if we just cast our eye on what the great cities of the future look like, they're about intensification, they're about their downtowns, they're about being able to get around, uh, you know, easily, all of that good stuff. So you've got strong voices like hers and like yours, and you've got 18,000 Hamiltonians who, you know, completed the survey, 90% of which are on on board. It's a revolution, as, as Don said a minute ago. But this is a town where we have too often seen um, council not necessarily listen to citizens, right? To that they don't pay attention to surveys if they don't align with what they're looking for. So what do we need to do to fight? I'm talking specific tactically here, beyond the loan signs and the letters to the editor and that usual stuff. Uh, what do you mean, Linda, when you say continue to fight? And then I'll, I'll wrap up with you, Don, on this question. What can be done? Yeah, so so next steps, we're saying to people, stay engaged in the process. There, there's more coming. There's a really important meeting that was shifted from October 25th to November 9th. We'll be there. We're going to be encouraging others to participate, whether it's at the meeting or by contacting their counselor and the mayor ahead of time. We're offering a delegation training workshop through Environment Hamilton and Stop Sprawl Hamont, because part of this is also helping people to understand you have a voice um, and you have a right to weigh in on these important issues about the future of our city. And, and as well, I think, I think at another level, we all need to keep on calling out this provincial government because we know a big part of what's fueling this madness is the problematic changes that we've seen at the provincial level with provincial planning policy, extensions of planning horizons so that 
municipalities are being forced to project 30 years into the future, um, reductions in intensification and density targets at a time when we know the climate emergency is upon us, a shift to market demand being you know, a, a top driving force in how cities have to assess the amount of land that they need to accommodate growth. All of this is crazy. Coming up to an election next year, it's a year away from almost today. Uh, what can people do, Don? Well, I, I understand what's happening here and I find it really interesting. Uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs is writing op-ed pieces in The Spectator. Mm. I, I don't notice that very often. And I think what we're seeing is desperation. We're seeing that there's a lot of money on, this, on the table here. Those who own those lands that they want to sprawl out onto, 3,300 acres of prime farmland, uh, expect to make an awful lot of money off that. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd count out the number of houses that they hope to put there and the price of houses today and the price has gone up dramatically. The cost of making them hasn't gone up nearly as dramatically. So there's a, a huge financial benefit for the developers. And they're now seeing that slip away. They're seeing that the public has turned clearly against them and it understands that this is not a future that they want, as the public wants. This is a future that a handful of, in many cases, billionaires want in order to continue to pad their bottom lines. So uh, I'm quite optimistic that uh, when people like uh, the provincial officials, the minister jumps in and starts making big waves on this. And he's basically saying nothing different than what the developers are saying. It's like they wrote his piece for him and he's put his name on it. Uh, so this is a, a government that uh, clearly has, uh, it's, uh, has clearly been a major friend of the developers. They're the ones who, uh, if you remember back when uh, uh, Doug Ford was running for office. Uh, a video came out of him telling a group of developers, when I get in, I'm going to open up the green belt. We're going to get all that land out there available to you. And then he had to run for cover when that came public. But that's what effect he's doing. Uh, he's opening up as much land as possible for his developer friends. Maybe he believes it ideologically, or maybe it's just a matter that these are the people who fund his campaigns. But at the end of the day, Certainly the public in Hamilton wants nothing to do with this. They're ready to stand up on it. They've stood up on it already and they're going to continue to do so. Well, thank you both. Thank you both, Don McLean from Catch Citizens at City Hall and Linda Dukasik from Environment Hamilton for standing up for the city, for the environment and the economic case that we should be intensifying, not sprawling. Uh, you're both brilliant and I love having voices of you know, that are trusted on issues that Hamiltonians care about here on the O Show, and you are both certainly that. So thank you for being here. Hope to have you on again another time. Take care and be safe.